That's what we're saying to the legislature and the governor in this session. Given the magnitude of the financial challenge facing our state, we're not asking for new money to hire new judges right now. We're just saying, don't cut us anymore. And that would be about, 200, as I said, $272 million every year. So the problem did not uh, come about overnight, and it's not going to be solved That's overnight. That's exactly right. So what you're, you're asking for is some time. Hold, harm, hold us harmless okay. right now. Hold okay. us harmless right now. Okay, now, now Chief Justice Gilday, let's, let's move to a different aspect of the law and, and the court system. Uh, persons accused of a crime. Yes. And let, let's zero in on the public defender uh, system. Uh, first of all, uh, why is the public defender system necessary? Well, it's necessary because when the government is bringing all of the weight of the government behind an accusation and accusing someone of a crime, that person is entitled to a level, level playing field. And they need mm -hmm. a lawyer to help them. Not everybody can afford a lawyer. And so our Constitution provides that if you can't afford a lawyer, the government will, will give you a lawyer. The government will provide you with an attorney. That's a matter of federal constitutional law and our state constitutional law. And so our public defenders serve a vital function for our justice system to work. We often describe the justice system in Minnesota, the criminal justice system, as a three-legged stool. The mm -hmm. courts are one leg, the mm -hmm. prosecutor is another leg, and the public defenders are the third mm -hmm. leg. And they provide a very important function. In mm -hmm. fact, you know, our public defenders are some of the best lawyers in Minnesota, and mm -hmm. Minnesotans really should be proud of the work that those lawyers perform. And this program is being brought to you through AFL-CIO, and I might mention that the uh, public defenders could very well, are in fact uh, members of AFSCME, our, our public employee. Uh, union. Uh, just correct me if I'm wrong though, the uh, uh, Gideon versus Wayne Wainwright, is that the yes, court? Is that, that, that's is the, that case. the court run? Yeah, yes. About 1965, 68? It's in the right? 1960s, yeah, yes. Yeah. So that, uh, you know, if, if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. That's the case from the United States Supreme Court, yes. But in Minnesota, we already had a public defender system. I mean, mm -hmm. I was talking to the vice president, Vice President Mondale, the, um, a few mm -hmm. weeks ago about the funding crisis mm -hmm. for the public defender system in Minnesota, and he reminded me that Gideon really was a Minnesota idea. We have yeah. so much to be proud of mm -hmm. in Minnesota, and it's, it's really a shame what's happened to our system. They have lost about 15 percent of their lawyers due to, mm -hmm. to, to their funding. Um, cuts in their budget. And that cannot be. I mean, the system grinds to a halt. If you don't have a public defender, you're entitled to a public defender, and there, one, and there isn't one there, then the other two legs of the stool have to wait. Mm -hmm. We can't proceed through the trial if there isn't a lawyer there. So it has a domino effect mm -hmm. because, so there isn't a public defender there, so you can't go forward with that case, and then everything else gets backed up while we're waiting for the public defender. And the public defenders already in Minnesota carry many more times the average caseload mm -hmm. than the um, American Bar Association says that they should. And then on top of that, their budget has been cut. And it's not sustainable. I mean, the governor and the legislature have got to fix that problem. And, and public defenders could be defending people who are accused of very serious crimes. Absolutely. Uh, felonies. That's uh, exactly right. In fact, of all the, of all the felony uh, uh, cases, that, are, that, that come to the court system, uh, approximately what, what percent of them are defended by public defenders? Oh, more so with public defender than not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think I read a statistic, it, was, it kind of blew, blew my mind. It was in the neighborhood of 80, 85 percent. That uh, could uh, be. Yeah, I mean, was, uh, that could be. Yeah. So uh, there was a temporary fix to the uh, funding for public defenders? Well, not uh, a fix. I mean, I mean, there's a big a, hole, a temporary bend. and so and so a little bit of the hole we put in a little, you know, we put in a little bit of filled in the hole a little bit through an increase in lawyer fees. The Minnesota okay. Supreme Court yeah, that's right. um, is in charge of lawyers and behavior of lawyers and licensure of lawyers, mm -hmm. and you pay a fee to have your license, and so we increased the fee temporarily for two years mm -hmm. um, to provide just a little bit of support for the public yeah. defender system. Um, and that um, the public defenders have come back to the court and asked for that fee increase to continue. And the court hasn't made a decision about that yet. But that's just a piece of, of this whole. It's really the, uh, 
responsibility of state government to provide well, the funding. I mean, it is a government obligation. It is a, you are entitled under the Constitution to a government-provided lawyer. Uh, another another uh, type, type of uh, circumstance. If the accused person uh, trial is not dealt with in a constitutionally prescribed speedy way, uh, may charges have to be dropped? Yes. Um, the Constitution entitles people accused of a crime to a speedy trial. And it, it's obvious why that's so. We don't want people mm -hmm. held. People are presumed innocent. And we don't want them to have to spend time in prison, just sitting there in prison or jail, mm -hmm. waiting for their case to be heard. So you have the right to a speedy trial. And if the government can't meet that speedy trial demand, then charges have to be dismissed. And we've already seen in Minnesota in the last 18 months or two years, three cases that have three felony cases that have been dismissed um, because the government was not able to meet speedy trial demands. Mm -hmm. And by the government, I mean the court system was not able to meet speedy mm -hmm. trial demands. These were cases where the, the prosecutor accused someone of committing a crime, the person went through a trial, a jury of their peers found them guilty, and then the case goes up on appeal to our Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals holds it took too long. Yeah. It took too long. So these cases have had to be dismissed. So on, on the opposite side of a coin, a presumably innocent person may, may not be out uh, of jail pending trial yes. if, he, if he or she has not been able to post, to post bail. Uh, so that person may spend an unwarranted length, length of time in, in jail uh, awaiting uh, an opportunity to appear before a judge. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what have the various sectors of the justice system done to uh, uh, reduce costs and to improve uh, e efficiencies? Well, for our part in the judiciary, we have been embarking upon a multi-year effort to redesign how we do what we do. Mm -hmm. The biggest initiative underway in the judiciary right now relates to what we call payable citations. So we get in the court system about 1.7 million cases filed every year in Minnesota. That's all case types. About a million of, them, of those cases are classified as payable citations. Mostly it's traffic tickets. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that never, uh, not relevant to you ever, I'm sure. <laughs> but also DNR tickets mm -hmm. and municipalities write ordinances and ordinance violations can be payable citations. Saying it's a payable citation means you don't have to come to court, mm -hmm. you can simply pay it. Um, and so what we're doing is we're moving the processing of these one million cases from 87 different counties, we operate, the court system does, mm -hmm. operates in all 87 counties. We're moving the processing of these citations into one central process. And we're, so we're taking it out of the local courthouse. And we've got people, this is the first for us, we're using a virtual workplace model. Yeah. So we've got employees working from home offices. And that's all they're doing is processing these one million cases and they're operating a call center. We're automating a lot of the data entry. So what, on the old way, what used to happen is, let's say it's the city of Edina and somebody gets a traffic ticket in Edina. So the ticket, the paper ticket comes into the courthouse. A court staff person who's doing 17,000 different things mm -hmm. gets this ticket and has to manually look up all right, how much of it go, how much of the fee, how much of the fine goes to Edina? How much goes to yeah. the library? How much goes here and there? Now with this new system, the computer automatically does that fee splitting. Mm -hmm. And if somebody doesn't pay on time, the computer automatically sends the debt to the Department of Revenue, which is our collection agent. Mm -hmm. And also, as a result of this initiative now, and again, I know it wouldn't ever impact you because you never get traffic tickets, but somebody who does, you can pay it online now if you want to, over the internet, or you can pay it on the phone. So it's a really big initiative for us, and when, when it's fully up and running, we anticipate that it's going to save us about $2.7 million and free up 50 court staff to do other case-related work. Mm -hmm. So that's a really big initiative. Another um, initiative that we're really proud of is our virtual self-help center. As the economy worsens, the number of self-represented people mm -hmm. goes up. And so what we're doing is trying to make it easier for people who 
choose not to or can't afford a lawyer, they come in in family court, let's say, or mm -hmm. they come in in conciliation court. And we have a self-help center that they can mm -hmm. access over the internet mm -hmm. and get help with the most common case types. There are little video tutorials they can watch on how to file things. Mm -hmm. And there's a call center where they can call and talk to a live person if they want to. And if you don't have a computer at your house, we've got computers at our courthouses all around the state. And, so, and, and at public libraries. Yes. And many of them are at public libraries. Yeah. Yes. And so that's a, another really big initiative that we have underway to try to um, help us manage mm -hmm. the ever-shrinking government resources. So we're... We're looking at the Minnesota State Legislature to hold the courts harmless yes. uh, during, during, the, during the next year or two. During this biennium, uh, yes, yes, the next two years, and, and yes. Then, and then we uh, hope to move forward uh, following that. Yes, and, and, and we will continue, of course, to, to streamline and try to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's going on in the private sector. The public expects it, and, and we understand that, and we're doing that in the judiciary. Okay. And I want to talk about one, one other subject. Sure. Uh, AFL-CIO has long uh, endorsed the efforts of the Cui, Cui Commission yes. and, its, and its successor or organizations uh, to, pres to preserve the impartiality of Minnesota judges uh, by having uh, evaluations of judges be, uh, be done and, 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 and be public and be available to, aver to average citizens. Because most people don't know yes. who, who, they're, who they're voting for and that people have a chance to, to vote. Yes, I want this judge to stay in office, or no, I don't want this judge to stay in office. Uh, we have worked, your AFL uh, being we, 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 we have worked with a number of chief judges, Ru Russ Anderson, mm -hmm. uh, we have not mentioned, uh, other members of the Supreme Court, such as Alan Page, and a diverse group of organizations uh, around, around the table uh, uh, in this effort. So as a, as a new chief justice, uh, do, you, do you support these efforts? We owe Al Governor Cui so much mm -hmm. for really bringing this conversation to the fore for Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. How we pick our judges is vitally important. And we have to make sure that the people of Minnesota continue to have trust and confidence in their judges. And, you know, for my part, I don't think it's up to judges to tell the people how to pick their judges. Mm -hmm. Whatever system we use, whether it's the proposal advocated by Governor Cui, whether it's mm -hmm. the current system, what we do have to make sure of, it seems to me, is that we keep partisan politics as far away from judicial selection as possible. When you're a judge, however you come to the bench, whether you go through merit selection like I did, contested election, however you come to the bench, when you're a judge, you're a judge for all Minnesotans. You're a judge for Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. and Independents and Green Party and people with no party. And we have to make sure that the people have trust and confidence that the judge that they're appearing before mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, in front of, is going to be fair and impartial mm -hmm. and not be thinking about platforms in a political party yeah. um, platform. And when we, we talk about pu public e evaluations, we're not talking about um, this side of a case or that side of a case. We're talking about time, timeliness of decisions. Uh, demeanor. Demeanor. D yeah. are, do they, does the judge appear to be listening? Does yeah. the judge appear to understand the law? Are they yeah. fair? Things like that, uh, absolutely. Is, is courtesy extended to all, to all parties in, in, exactly. in, in, in the court? And, and it does not get down to uh, facts to, to a, a decision in, in, in a case. And, uh, yes. Uh, because you know, by the time you get to a, a Supreme Court, especially, you know, you know, cases are very, very complex, and it's not a matter of saying yes, yes or no on, 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 on an issue, because there's there's a great, great deal, great deal at at stake. And, yes, uh, absolutely. People come to us with the most important matters in their lives, mm -hmm. and we must decide each case that comes before us, mm -hmm. one human circumstance at a time, in a fair and impartial way. Okay. And our award-winning director, uh, Roger Carlson, is telling me that we just have a few seconds left uh, in, our, in our program. I want to thank our entire uh, award-winning crew uh, for making this, this, this production possible. Larry, Larry Chadwick, Ed, Ed Rapp, and Mary Benner uh, in today's program. And a special thank you uh, to today's guest, uh, Chief Justice Lori Gilday, who has shared with us her in insights in, in the, into the dollars and cents crisis facing the entire uh, court system in the state of Minnesota. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me.